I came to bring the pain hardcore from the brain. Welcome to this new episode of Fact Heist. In this episode, you will learn almost everything about hot peppers, all the good good brain science behind it, and why it burns like a motherfucker. First of all, the term pepper is often used interchangeably with the term chili, but IRL, pepper is supposed to refer to this blackberries thing, from the genus Piper. I mean like salt and pepper stuff. Wow 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 chilies, on the other hand, are these hot fruits from the genus capsicum, you dumb fuck, and these are the very chilies we'll talk about today, or today and tomorrow, if you watch this video shortly before midnight. Anyway, from now on, I'll use the pepper word as much as the chili one, not to crawl to nowadays average level of illiteracy, but for redundancy purpose obviously. The standard measure unit for food spiciness is the Scoville heat unit. As you probably already know, this scale was invented back in 1912 by some American farm racist, I mean pharmacist called Wilbur Scoville. The Scoville scale consists of measuring how much some spicy shit must be diluted until the heat is no longer detectable by the average homo sapiens. Even my crew is feeling the burn. As this might be a sketchy varying subjective way to measure things. <laughs> it's actually going through my- <laughs> My mask. Yeah, it goes through the mask pretty good. We then swap to high performance liquid chromatography, or some Star Trek shit like that. For example, a sweet bell pepper can rank up to zero Scoville units, while Tabasco can range from 2,500 Scoville units for the OG Tabasco sauce, then up to 35,000 for its top of the line scorpion sauce, which sounds like Fisher Price spiciness compared to what's up to come in a little while. The spiciness in hot peppers comes from a colorless and odorless but nevertheless highly irritant molecule called C18H27 No3, aka the infamous capsaicin. On the other side, horseradish, wasabi and mustard are made of smaller lighter molecules that can effortlessly float up into your sinuses. This is why it burns your nose. And spicy is not a taste, at all, unlike bitter, sour, umami, salty or sweet that trigger taste buds, capsaicin will instead aim for thermoreceptors in your mouth. You have them receptors all over your body, and they're the same that are activated for extreme heat. This is why when you eat a chili pepper your mouth feels like it's burning because your brain is tricked into processing a burning sensation. But more on that later. The opposite happens when you munch on menthol stuff. The fresh mini compound activates your cold receptors. For a long time, archaeologists thought that God created chilies in South America like around 200 years ago. But recently, like in 2023, recently, told ya, some more lucky archaeologists stumbled upon 50 million years old fossils of the fruit, but in Colorado this time. America, fuck yeah! But since then, during millions of years, the capsicum gene spread and diversified. There are also some 6,000 years old archaeological and genetic evidences that humans, throughout Americas, independently domesticated different strains of hot peppers. So this is possibly the oldest spice ever domesticated, and possibly why it is the most cultivated crop in the world today. No shit. The constant race to engineer the hottest pepper on earth has been a perpetual battle since the 90s, and for like the last decade, two or three chilies often come in everyone's mind. The ghost pepper, the Trinidad Moruga scorpion, and of course, the merciless peppers of Quetzal Zacatenango. I mean, and of course the Carolina Reaper. The ghost pepper is some kind of hybrid from India, where it was studied by the army for weaponization. No shit, this ghost pepper thing was even used by villagers as a killer elephant repellent. No shit. As this loco chili can be registered over the 1 million Scoville unit mark, it needs to be now termed super hot peppers, which you have to wear gloves for, in order to avoid chili burns on skin. The next cultivar is this scorpion Trinidad pepper moruga whatever whatever, which can reach 1,200,000 Scoville units, as those chilies are literally weapon grade, I'm not making this up, those world record fruits are mainly publicity for hot sauce producers. What if we did like a giant devil, pissing hot sauce, right into King Kong's mouth? I'm not making a hot sauce for soccer moms, Klaus, I said bold! As you can sell more shit with world record breaking shit. That's what happened unexpectedly in 2K13 to Ed Curry. Ooh man, he's here! The dude with the fireproof stomach. He's an American breeder who, according to the legend, was, allegedly, trying to create a cultivar with some special capsicinoid or some shit in order to trigger an autoimmune sequence in cancer cells. You're not an oncologist. Mm -mm. You're not a cancer researcher. No. Sounds a bit like snake oil bullshit. But the dude might have been onto something, as you'll see later in this video. 
But instead, he ended up creating the world's hottest pepper, the world famous Carolina, Carolina Reaper. Reaper. Carolina Reaper. Carolina Reaper. Carolina Reaper. Carolina Reaper. Carolina Reaper. Carolina Reaper. A pepper 300 times hotter than a jalapeno. Its name comes from the shape of its tail. It has a fruity taste, it's sweet, and then immediately turns to plasma in your mouth hole, as it is skyrocketing around 2 million Scoville units. PSA, try not to touch your eyes. <laughs> Side note. This part about the hottest peppers was supposed to end now, but, fun fact, during the, writing, of this sketchy text, like yesterday, this Ed Curry dude came up with something 10 years in the making, the pepper, X, and then this happened. We've confirmed an average rate of 2,693,000 Scoville heat units. Yeah. It's a new Guinness World Records title for the hottest pepper. So now I guess we have the hottest pepper in the galaxy. <laughs> But how the fuck and why the fuck did the plant evolve such weird and fiery trick in the first place you might be asking. From an evolutionary perspective, producing capsaicin comes obviously at a cost for the chili. Because producing such a large molecule requires valuable resources like nitrogen, and furthermore spicy peppers are unfortunately less efficient at using water than their non-spicy counterparts. So there might be an evolutionary challenge indeed, but somehow, the advantages of producing this fiery compound outweighs the costs anyway. Until recently, the main hypothesis about the probable function of capsaicin was that it kept mammals, human included, away from eating them. Which may sound stupid as fuck, because fruiting plants are supposed to rely on us animals to spread the seeds right. If you take the plant point of view, <sighs> this is the life. No stress, just eating bees. Being able to find a way to disperse your seeds might be great, but that's all pointless if these seeds get fully destroyed by crushing teeth and an aggressive digestive tract. But unlike mammals, birds don't have those negative features. In fact, birds don't have teeth, duh, that could pulverize seeds, their digestive tract is smoother and is even more fertile, and most of all, birds are way better seed spreaders than many other animals. Foshoa, so the plant had to repel mammals, while staying attractive to birds. And to perform such manipulations, the chili plant took, somehow, advantage of an old mammalian feature, some sketchy-ass vanilloid receptor. Namely the transient receptor potential cation channel subfamily V member 1, aka TRPV1, aka the capsaicin receptor, aka the vanilloid receptor. But I'll go with TRPV1, obviously. The thing is, those receptors, which are not taste buds, appeared very early during evolution of vertebrates. I mean like around 400 million years ago, way before Earth became flat. So this heat receptor is widely spread among the mammalian realm and stuff, helping us warning our organisms by sensing dangerously high levels of heat. <coughs> Meanwhile, during eras, the plant evolved. The ability to repel seed-crushing animals away, by activating this pain in the ass type of receptor, and its resulting sensory burning illusion across different species. Meanwhile, birds evolve not this shit at all because of genetic divergence, resulting in their heat-sensing nerves not sensing at all capsaicin, therefore the fiery burn of the peppers. This hypothesis held up for a while among scientists, and is commonly known as the direct deterrent hypothesis. Well at least I tried to give you the gist of it. But for some reason, researchers weren't happy enough with this explanation and then led further lab and field studies, and apparently them scientists dudes came up with proofs that this direct deterrent thing is all bullshit, I mean not all all bullshit, not all the way down, no I mean it's true, yes that's it, it's all true and shit, but that's only a beneficial side effect at least. Because, as a matter of fact, peppers aren't any spicier wherever and whenever there are more mammalian plant eaters around to munch on them. The now, mainly accepted theory, comes from studies about the natural variations in pepper spiciness, and how it develops way much more in warmer climate. The very type of climate where some fungus, and microbes, and insects are prevalent and devastating to wild chilies. And it is found that some fungus was indeed, the only significant cause of damage to fruit and seeds prior to dispersal. But insects are bummers to peppers too, but capsaicin appears also to be an excellent bug repellent, which is very useful, because whenever some insect munches on the fruit, the scar then gives a foothold for any fungi to grow and spread and fuck shit up. So peppers evolve some build-in pest control system as well, preventing the plant from further tissue damage. And then capsaicin would stop any fungi growth infection afterward. And indeed, it's been observed that, wherever both some spicy and unspicy version of the same pepper grow, the hotter one is way much less likely to be infected with fungus. So in the late 2000s, researchers started to think that this mold shit, not the old mammal shit, would be the real reason for spiciness. And if mammals are repulsed by them peppers, it's more of a helpful side bonus. 
Furthermore, as capsicum can inhibit or even kill up to 75% of bacteria, this could have been a valuable way of keeping food longer and fresher, or more broadly, it limited food spoilage. And the fossil record shows effectively that humans started to add spice, like 6,000 years ago, to kill off bacteria and some food-borne human parasite. Side note, this kind of ecological pressure upon populations' psychological and social behavior is known as parasite stress theory, you're welcome. But, for humans, obviously, there's more than those antifungal and antimicrobial properties. Back in the day, people also used the smoke of burning dried peppers as a weapon against enemies, just like some early mace pepper spray type of shit. But furthermore, to punish children, hot spicy powder or sauce was put on their lips if they were caught lying or they could have been held over burning dried hot chilies, leading to difficulty breathing, which could deprive children of oxygen, resulting sometimes in death. This kind of treatment for disobedient unruly kids was reported to be quite effective. But how does this spicy shit work in the first place? I mean, on a more brain-centered level, because after all, you're not watching National Geographic, no offense. As previously said, the TRPV1 receptors are in charge of tricking your brain into feeling hot plasma on your tongue. Those receptors are proteins, and are encoded by the obvious TRPV1 gene. Their function, among other things I probably missed, is to detect and regulate body temperature, to detect bitter substances able to damage tissues or to mediate the detection of noxious environmental stimuli. To sum this up, those thermoreceptors are mostly involved in nociception, aka the sense of pain. But the main role of those capsaicin receptors, are, of course, to sense hot substances, I mean above 43 degrees Celsius, like extreme heat body sensors. I hope you start to draw the link between temperature and pain. I'm making a connection. Once you put capsaicin loaded stuff in your mouth hole, the burning shit binds to any available TRPV1 receptors in a tail up head down configuration. Kick your face down, kick the ass up, you know what you're doing, kick that shit moving. Then capsaicin will act like a key into a lock, the lock bin those receptors, Foshoa, but this lock and key situation doesn't open any door, but some ion channels instead an ion being some positively or negatively charged atom. In this case, when TRPV1 channels open, they swallow sodium and calcium ions. The amount of capsaicin in a pepper will affect the intensity of that signal. Foshoa, then calcium and sodium ions will reach nociceptor nerve endings, triggering the depolarization of those nociceptive neurons, leading to an action potential firing aiming for the brain. This neural electric impulse travels then through the trigeminal nerve, that's the fifth and most complex of the cranial nerve. It detects face sensations and it is in charge of motor functions of the jaw and shit. Therefore, if you eat some Carolina Reaper, Dope, that's a Carolina Reaper! The trigeminal nerve gets busy, dying, big time. Yeah! Ow! Ow! Yeah! I'll have what he's heaving. Because the nervous system is now using the same danger danger information highway to hell as it would do for some dangerously high temperatures. Then, once those fiery S signals reach the brain part of the headpiece, the informations go to their own dedicated part of the sensory cortex. This sensory cortex thing thing is the part of the brain that receive incoming inputs about sensations like touch, or pain, or pressure, you name it. This brain area contains some space in charge for the sensation of almost every single body part, but in proportion to its importance and use and sensitivity of course. So when the painful neural signal from capsaicin reaches the sensory cortex, it goes to the areas dedicated to the tongue, and inner cheeks, and gums and lips, obviously, assuming you put the hot pepper in the mouth. And then the trickery happens, as from now on, the nervous system is completely fooled into perceiving dangerously high levels of heat. As the brain experiences this blazing fire message, it has therefore to respond accordingly. I love the flavor. <laughs> I think there's some oak in it. Because from the primitive point of view of the brain, this capsaicin shit is now a toxin it needs to get rid of. And because the signals get also shuttled into the limbic system as well, reward and threat processes are triggered as well. There, in the limbic system, the hypothalamus, that controls the fight or flight response, switches on adrenal glands, which will in turn release adrenaline, so there's a small adrenaline rush, and then the nervous system will instantly elicit protective reflexes. Your heart beats faster, you start to sweat, your nose run, tears stream. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. You breath as much air as possible to cool down your mouth. You want to drink something cold, you drool like a motherfucker, you cough, you gag, you try anything to temper the perceived incendiary pain. Anything to get your body to cool off and to get this capsaicin out. Basically, this little Carolina Reaper elicits the same fight or flight response with which your body reacts to most threats. But afterward, some chemical relief is sent to help you deal through these hard times. First, your brain will produce dopamine, which will give a rush of pleasure, but also, endorphins. 
Endorphins are some kind of peptides produced by the brain. Their main task is to block pain and stress signals, and to increase the feeling of well-being. The term comes from endogenous morphine. I guess you can draw a link between the name and its narcotic effects. I... I'm making a connection. The resulting analgesia, along with a rush of pleasure, might be some key reasons to explain why we love those weapon-grade chilies. That's because, in some way, it kinda gets us high. <laughs> the combined chemical will induce some euphoria which would be similar to a runner's high. This controlled threat at a distance, in some protective frame, is like some kind of roller coaster. At first the immediate sensation can feel or look unpleasant, but the ensuing thrill provides reward and pleasure. That's some example of constrained risk. Your body default primitive reaction mode thinks you are in danger, but your rational human brain overrides this shit, as it knows there's no actual threat, that the pain is not real, therefore harmless. Some mind over the body type of thing. Guided meditation worked for cancer, it could work for this. Because we have the capacity to kinda cognitively discount the noxious stimuli as fictional. Furthermore, studies show that the more someone enjoys hot spicy food, the more likely he or she is to enjoy other extreme experiences or activities. Parkour! The cheap thrill, and the narcotic-like rush coming from those experiences, can be kinda addictive, and is indeed linked to some of our thrill-seeking drive. And partly because, in some weird ways, we kinda love pain and suffering. Pain and pleasure. Indivisible. Such meta-experience is a form of what's known as hedonistic reversal, aka benign masochism. When humans derive pleasure from seemingly negative experiences, just think horror movies, escape games, German porn or extreme sports. We're just cool bad kids doing young stuff. You guys want to do more skateboard moves? Which ones? The rad ones, that's which. <laughs> the taste and pleasure associated with hot peppers generally increases with time and exposure. The more you eat chilies, the more the scalding roller coaster becomes enjoyable. <laughs> as you learn to increasingly associate the pain of the experience with some incoming pleasure. Some things have to be endured, and that's what makes the pleasure so sweet. And once you practice a bit, you can build up a tolerance. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You breathe it in, and it's like you have a sea urchin, right? Like Lodge, right here. And even add hotter varieties. Actually, and according to studies, the burning bite doesn't get any better, you just get tougher. <laughs> Fatality, flawless victory. And researchers found that, over time, people seemingly like this scorching pain more and more. The sweet suffering. Moreover, there can also be some genetic and social factors at play here. If you get accustomed to spicy food while growing, for like cultural background or some shit, you are more likely to enjoy hot peppers because of the early repeated exposure. Likewise, the gene sequencing that produces TRPV1 proteins varies from person to person. So there's clearly certain versions of the receptors that are more or less responsive to capsaicin than others. Therefore some people may have chosen to be born with a genetic makeup that induces a predisposition toward spicier food. But once this sensory seesaw from hell gives this chainsaw bite on the tongue, oh kill me now. I mean when some chili burn your tongue one time too many, and you can't stand it. To wash down the burn, unfortunately, capsaicin molecules have a hydrocarbon tail, this part right here, which means they're non-polar. What's that? Which means they're hydrophobic. Water? You keep it away. Which means it doesn't mix quite that well with water. Because like dissolves like. So don't reach for water to ease the scalding burn, because as it is polar, it would be like mixing oil and water, it won't work out that well, and you'll eventually just churn capsaicin around. Don't reach for beer either, it is carbonation or some shit, which is some kind of irritant, so it will just enhance pain signals. But I need it! But this fiery burn in the mouth ain't the only negative side effects at all. Because, once upon a time, in 2001, some dude, probably in the US, ate a whole ghost pepper. That's a ghost pepper. Or maybe a whole Carolina Reaper. That's a Carolina Reaper! I'm too much of a lazy ass to find out anyway. So after eating this whole weapon grade pepper, this Darwin Award winner developed what's called a thunderclap headache, or reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. That's a massive inflammation of the meninges, those three thick fibrous layers protecting the brain. In fact, there's a swelling of this meninges thing, along with a sudden constriction and tightening of the blood vessels that supply blood to the brain. Those sharp unbelievable headaches are actually some inflammation induced brain damages. So don't try to mimic what you saw on those YouTube shows. I don't see the point of hearing non-stop loud mouth and chewing and swallowing sounds.
here's another member of the dominant species of this planet. This one isn't for a picture on a wall. This one's for pride. Doing this challenge to earn a bumper sticker. Get your picture on the wall, a mug, a t-shirt, and bragging rights. Behold the reversal Flynn effect in full effect. I can't stand those shows. I'm not touching that thing, I'll get neurotypical cooties. So let's focus on the numerous health effects of capsaicin instead. That's a powerful antioxidant, a potent anti-inflammatory and apparently a quite efficient anti-obesity. Furthermore, some study from 2015 by the British Medical Journal, link in the description below, found that those who are on a spicy diet have a 14% lower risk of death than those who don't, which means 14% can't die. What? Like if you were in a shootout, your ability to dodge bullets increases by 14% or some shit? What? No, that actually means that on the average, people who eat spicier foods may have reductions up to 14% in chronic diseases and their mortality patterns. Reductions in troubles such as food poisoning, respiratory ailments like asthma, type 2 diabetes, but also reductions in heart diseases, and as previously stated, obesity. But I like being fat because it's comfortable, and I like myself fat. I like it fat too. This suggests that capsaicin doesn't just kill fake ass microbes, but can actually increase life expectancy. This study was made with participants from a variety of lifestyles, educations levels, or ethnic backgrounds. But these studies are just based on huge self-reported databases. Man! So it's unclear which kind of chilies were consumed, how often, how spicy the food was. This is a capsicum extract. That's dangerous. And this is 9 million school units. Pure pepper extract. So those results need to be taken with a grain of salt, but a lot of guacamole. Nonetheless, the said study used data from a biobank with physical measurements collected from over 5,000 Chinese citizens. I guess this adds street cred to those results. In addition, hot chilies can be an excellent nutritional therapeutic agent against stomach ulcers, because capsaicin stimulates protection against injury-causing agents, especially Helicobacter pylori, the public enemy number one bacteria in the stomach ulcer game. As capsaicin inhibits acid secretion, but promotes gastric mucosal blood flow, this prevents the growth of Helicobacter pylori, therefore it inhibits ulcer growth, or any Helicobacter pylori shit induced gastrointestinal diseases. This benefactor aspect of peppers could be helpful for a bunch of people with some digestive issues. <laughs> Likewise, case control studies correlated ingestion of hot chilies with a decreased risk of gastric cancer. But that's actually just the tip of the iceberg, because there are indeed shitloads of evidences, links in the description below, that capsaicin could have more direct cancer-fighting effects. Capsaicin seems to inhibit cancer cell growth and promotes apoptosis, aka some kind of programmed cell destruction mode. In fact, capsaicin has been shown to induce this apoptosis destruction session in numerous different type of cancer cells, including leukemia, along with skin, prostate, pancreas, colon, liver and bladder cancer as well. There might not be any scientific linkage, but Ed Curry, who is indeed a skin and thyroid cancer survivor, and who had seven tumors removed from his body, has, according to the lore, stayed cancer-free since he started eating nasty burning hot peppers on a daily basis. The apoptosis biochemical suicide program is induced by some sketchy molecular process. Capsaicin binds to special proteins on the membrane of cells, and then, in response to this binding, the tumor cells respond by killing themselves. These adverse effects of capsaicin, without collateral damages, are classified as selective toxicity. That's the ability for an antimicrobial agent to harm or kill some microorganism cell or some shit without harming the cells of the host organism. You're welcome. Furthermore, studies suggest that it might also even prevent angiogenesis, aka the growth of new blood vessels, and then since cancer cells need blood to get nutrients so they can grow out of control, impairing angiogenesis can help shrink or even kill cancer tumors which sounds like good news to me. So capsaicin might actually extend your life, but some people might be more into the direct reward endorphin system thing than the extend your life thing, like yours truly. But this video won't be on this channel if we didn't discuss some more about what goes on in the headpiece. As a matter of fact, studies suggest that there's some geographic overlap between the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and hot pepper consumption. As a matter of fact, Alzheimer's disease, an elderly genetic shit show, has two main contributing factors, beta amyloid and tau proteins, that respectively create plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Beta amyloids are some kind of brain waste peptides, or a small proteins, that will stick together to form some rubbish heap called plaque, while tau proteins supply scaffolding and structure inside neurons' axons. Yes that thing. And when shit happens, this tau protein thing thing starts to aggregate to form those neurofibrillary tangles, which is brain garbage too. 
those two waste products are known to impair brain function by lowering intra and interneuronal signaling, resulting, of course, in cognitive decline. So broadly speaking, and if I get it right, when you mix beta amyloids trash and tau protein wastes, and then dump it into your brain, you get yourself an Alzheimer, or at least that's the gist of it. But according to studies, and for people in their 40s and over, capsaicin was proven to lower the concentration of amyloid beta, and its protein homey, therefore reducing Alzheimer's disease negative symptoms. Capsaicin was also found to alleviate other Alzheimer's disease type pathologies, such as neuroinflammation and neurodegeneration. For example, there are actually clinical trials on capsaicin as dietary supplement for the prevention or treatment of Alzheimer's disease. But hot chilies aren't only linked to neuroprotective effects, because it's been reported that capsaicin-rich diet is associated with better cognition, think about it. So capsaicin may offer some natural treatment to counterbalance or even prevent cognitive decline, especially considering the current lack of preventive strategies to fight cognitive aging. Further research are needed to see if this can translate into real pharmacological treatments to reduce risk of disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's disease. That means that hot chilies are way lot more than another stupid TikTok trend, and a little bit more than some masochistic taste for pain. So painful, and therefore so pleasurable. But so far, and unfortunately, if you want to harvest the benefits from capsaicin, you can only do it the hard way, by dancing with the devil himself. Of course everybody's mouth hole is different, and there are genetic makeup differences between individuals, obviously, then everybody's taste and tolerance are different. So if you're into trying this nasty scalding shit, I'll give you the usual soundbite, start low and then go slow, or start mild and then go wild. You pick your own. I hate to sound like a broken record but, your body just has to learn how to associate the pain with pleasure. Oh, it's painful, so I love it, thank you, oh, such pleasure. I didn't mean to cause you any pleasure, which causes me pain, which gives me pleasure. And that's it for this episode of Fact Heist. We hope you've enjoyed it. So don't forget to like and subscribe. If you want to learn how to make your own Fact Heist hot sauce, wait until this sketchy useless music part is over. See ya. Peace peace. So here is an easy way to make your own spicy sauce, you order them online, here are some I got from the Puckerbutt Pepper Company, they don't pay me, no instead I paid them sauces, but it's so addictive you start to need many many more. Look at my shit, look at my shit. So this is the easy way to get extra hot sauce, no ingredients needed, easy, told you. Or you can buy them some Carolina Reaper seeds and grow your own peppers. Fast forward many months later and you harvested and sun dried your Carolina Reapers. So here's my own sketchy, ghetto. Straight from the motherfucking slum that's busted hot sauce recipe. First, you need some other ingredients. Soy sauce. Sun-dried tomatoes. Your average already made tomato sauce. Sun-dried onions. And ketchup. Ketchup! Yeah, yeah, that's for some good old industrial sugary addictive purpose only. Now, get your pepper on a flat surface and crush it. I mean crush it good. Yeah, crush the shit out of it and into powder, because... The smaller the pepper powder grain the easier the sauce will be to handle in your mouth, therefore still looking good while eating. But if you forget to grind only one little chip, this can make you look bad on some romantic date, or worse. So mash it good.
now get your sun-dried tomatoes, and because your girlfriend doesn't want you to use her cooking shit for your, quote marks, hobo stuff, you will smoosh them with some scissors, you need to mash the shit out of it, into some smoosh. Sounds like it won't smoosh mish! Always keep it clean, keep it ghetto cuisine. Now you drop this smushy smoosh no smash. into the tomato sauce. Drop the pepper powder in there too. A little soy sauce. A hint of ketchup. Add the dried onions. Shake it well, but put on the lid beforehand. Shake it really well and then, here's your pepper sauce. No, the actual sauce should probably look like it. But now, what dish would be good enough for this awesome dressing? Some more sketchy recipe of course. For this one, you'll need, some instant noodles, these ones, the OG ones. But because you're a munchies freak, you'll need three of them. And because you're a massive freak you forgot to buy the next ingredient, which was supposed to be some assorted tagine vegetable kind of shit. Some North African dish with many many healthy stuff. This kind Mediterranean diet thing thing you've heard about. So this one is missing. Bummer. Plan B instead will go with some Asian leeks. Some more soy sauce. Vegan creme fraiche. And why not some more dried onions from earlier. Here's a picture of boiling water because I thought I recorded but I took a photo instead. So boil some water. Unpack the noodles. Keep this little onion thing because it's the real shit. But throw this thing away, it's mostly salt and it's not vegan. Throw the noodles in the water and then wring them out when they're still a bit firm. Display it on a plate with slices of leeks and some creme fraiche. Drop some of the hot sauce atop of it and voila, la grand cuisine. Or you can still remain full ghetto and do it within the casserole. That's less washing up. Drop in the onion stuff from the noodles. Then some veggie creme fraiche. Cream fraiche. Oh yeah. Ugh. Pour in some dried onions. Cut some leek. No don't wash them. It will upgrade your immune system. And then the freshly made sauce. Start to stir. Until it looks like this. Cut the noodles for smaller bites. Add your proper dose of soy sauce and then blend one last time. And then, voila. Some recipe everybody likes at home. I said everybody, try it and rejoice with your family. I think that's the perfect meal for a birthday or Christmas or any other quality time. Look at my shit. This ain't nothing. I got, I got rooms of this shit. And now you have it. See you next time. I'm out of here. Kiss kiss piss piss.